Good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. Thank you very much again to the Boeing company for sponsoring this afternoon's coffee break. The final session of the day will have a different focus in that it will be looking at some of the industry successes that have occurred thanks in part to the results of previous drone enable symposia. This session will include a demonstration followed by a panel discussion. The moderator for this session will be Mr. Steve Creamer, who is the director of ICAO's Air Navigation Bureau. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Steve Creamer and his panelists. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So it's my pleasure to serve as the moderator and uh, the uh, manual UTM for the movement of parts in this panel and demonstration. Uh, we're going to be doing a couple of things that are different for the room. So if you see something that looks like it's maybe not happening the way it should, it didn't happen here. We know it's going to happen the way it should. We've been talking a lot about some critical issues since the very first drone enable. So it's time for us now to have a look at where we are after two years and talk about how we can make some of this real and not just be talking about it. We're going to start out with uh, Mr. Christian Schlafer Heinkgartner. Christian is the uh, Secretary General of the uh, EuroK, and he's going to give us an overview of some of the work that's going on in Europe. Uh, from essentially a, a, a requirements perspective beyond just uh, this part of the industry and how it weaves into some of the other things that um, Europe is working on. And then uh, we'll be talking beyond that around drone enable, or excuse me, drone ID specifically. But before we talk about the specific drone ID and the demonstration, I'd like to ask Mr. Uh, Schleifer Heidgarner to come up and give us his remarks from the European perspective. Christian? Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve, and uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, Steve asked me to do the most boring part of this uh, panel at the beginning. So something exciting uh, will come up. Uh, you see there are many people around. They are waiting. Uh, some drones around. Uh, they want to show something. So Steve said, OK, Try to keep them awake, but it's getting better at the end. So talk about standardization. Okay, standards. And uh, there were a couple of uh, statements today already. I, I, I want to address as well. I, I wasn't prepared for that. But confusion, if there, is, uh, if there are different standards developed, uh, what are we doing, how we coordinate that. And let me try to, uh, uh, to address that a little bit. So, just to give an overview of what a standard developing organization is and uh, how we develop standards uh, that uh, actually is valid for all the standard developing organizations. And Phil is here uh, from ASTM, so I will speak for you as well here. So what we do here is uh, uh, we have members and, and actually they, they uh, have experts, they nominate and they are participating in the standard developing process. So it's not us, it's not Phil and me. Feel a little bit more than me, but uh, but we are not the experts. We don't develop the standards as an organization. We provide the platform, and you see uh, an example where our membership is coming from: CESAB, uh, Carrots, the modernization programs, R&D activities, the regulators, uh, the manufacturers, uh, the providers, the service providers, in in all those areas. We are all international organizations but we are based somewhere. They are based in, in the US, we are based in Europe. So our membership is 70% uh, Europeans, while 30% are global membership for us in Europe. So global means Asian Pacific, North America, Africa, wherever, you, uh, wherever we have members from. 
So we are, we are working in different domains. Where we're coming from was previously we developed standards uh, mainly for the uh, uh, on board of an aircraft for, for equipment. Uh, now we're doing much more and one part I want to concentrate today is for sure uh, the standards we are developing for drones, VTOLs and all the newcomers here and uh, what are we doing with that and, and, and how we integrate that in, in our work. So a big part of our work at the secretariat level of such a standard developing organization is coordination. Uh, I always say uh, we are somehow in the middle, but we are not the center of the universe. Uh, standards organizations are here in the middle. We need an input from R&D activities and somebody else needs to deploy, to implement industrialization. They need the, the, the result at the end of the day. So we coordinate uh, here on, on, on a global level. Uh, with, with ICAO, uh, we, we are part of the Standards Roundtable, that's a platform where we exchange what kind of activities we are having in order to support ICAO's work, so they can make reference to it. Uh, we are listed as a, uh, as a world, or we are accepted by the World Trade Organization as a standard developing organization, and most importantly, we try to join with other standard developing organizations in other regions. So RTCA, 50% of our activities are joined with RTCA, which is also a standard developing organization based in, in the US. That means at the end of the day, the standard is technically identical. That means if you fulfill the one standard, you automatically fulfill the other one. So we try to do that as much as possible to increase the participation and have local, uh, more local uh, participation uh, for the different organization. And 10% of our activities are, are with SCE. So how is that all linked to the regulatory frame? So we are going more performance-based, risk-based, and operation-centric. Especially on the drones, we see that the first time that the regulatory frame has changed completely to a prescriptive, or to a different way of certifying aviation. And here, uh, it's, it's, it's a new demand on standards in order to support this uh, kind of regulatory frame. Are standards reactive or proactive? I think there are good examples for both ways. So we see that sometimes there's a regulation for safety reasons, because of an accident, because of something. We need to support that with, with a standard. Sometimes the industry has good solutions. They come forward. They uh, want to have a standard in order to go, go, go then to the regulator and get certification for it. Florian this morning uh, made already the example or brought the example of the VTOLs where we have already applications for uh, uh, certification of, uh, of several products. So typically example is uh, again the ETSO an, an equipment. So the regulator has a one pager says okay if you want to have an approval for that and that you have to fulfill a minimum operation performance standard. So again also, the standard is not describing the technology you have to fulfill. They are, also, they, are, they are specifying the minimum operation performance standard you have to uh, comply with. And then there are software and, uh, and, and hardware assurance and environmental qualifications. So, for the uh, uh, drones, we are following the regulatory concept of drones, which are really operation-centric, proportionate, performance-based and risk-based. Again, it's the risk you have to identify first, you, the operation you have to define what you are doing, and then you go into the certification process, then you define the standards be, uh, below that. So it's not that you have an aircraft which is certified, and then you decide what kind of operation you are doing. It's the other way around here. So the scope of our activity in, uh, in EuroK, and you see working group 105 is the working group dealing with uh, drones. So we have, uh, the, the, the goal is the safe integration of all classes of US in all classes of airspace. So the range is really wide from those kind of uh, uh, drones here on the table until the full certified ones in a, in a full controlled airspace or in an uncontrolled airspace. So, and we again here uh, coordinate a lot with the regulatory frame in order to, to complement the regulatory frame. So we have to coordinate uh, the, those developments. So we coordinate with uh, uh, the uh, CIAs, with EASA in, in, in Europe, the FAA, ICAO, 
Uh, Charos uh, is an important part. And then the standard developing organization amongst each other, we are also coordinating that we are not having overlapping activities. So especially in Europe, we, we have a platform which is called the EUSCG, the European Unmanned Aircraft System Standards Coordination Group, where we also invite global uh, players, global standard developing organizations. So that's the no reason I know Phil quite well, because he is coming uh, with ASTM and also contribute to that. So we are making sure we don't have overlapping activities. That's one of the most demanding, or the industry gives us uh, this limitation. Don't duplicate any work and make sure that if you fulfill one standard, you are not having something uh, uh, conflicting uh, developed in, in a different organization. So this just briefly to show the structure. So we are doing standards on detect and avoid C3 UTM, and then I go a bit in more detail on that. Uh, design and diverseness. Error is enhanced uh, ARPA's automation, and, and here we have already standards published for highly automated functions. So we, we talked about that, so we are not there with autonomous flying, but highly automated functions here, and then on SORA. So the achievements, that was uh, actually the title of the, of the panel, so there are already, that's not music of tomorrow, this is this happening today and we have published already a couple of standards which are supporting the integration of, of drones today in detect and avoid, uh, in communication, C3 and UTM and, and, and especially on the era which I mentioned, this enhanced our automation. Uh, short term, and I want to concentrate a little bit more on the UTM because I want to address what's done on remote ID and e-identification. There is a little bit of difference and we want to address that a little bit difference, which includes also geofencing and geocaching and our minimum operation performance standards for e-identification. So again, the e-identification is a little bit different to uh, the remote ID, which includes use space services. We have heard that several times today in different presentations. It has a bit more than only the ident. It has a bit more to, uh, to support the operation, give you operational uh, information, data emitted electronically uh, by the US, uh, by the ground station, and if needed, uh, uh, re registry data for that. It has some functionalities added for surveillance in information, unmanned aircraft uh, or the remote pilot station uh, is, is submitting that and, and that will be uh, relayed to, to use space service providers or to other airspace users. So I don't have a clicker, that's the reason I always make these funny uh, signs. <laughs> so, uh, use space ident, and, and I said it's more the network identification via direct remote ID is something to identify uh, the drone itself, and I think we have uh, we have this demonstration later on. So that's on top, and we try to be compatible with uh, what, what is developed at, at ASTM and supplement that. So. There was a discussion today that we are developing something which is conflicting here. This should not be the case. We try to coordinate as much as possible that this is not conflicting. But we also want to make sure that this is not limiting, that we don't have any standards which are limiting uh, innovation that we have for UTM integration later on, uh, that we need more data so, so that we don't have a bottleneck. So. We talked about that part of this whole story is uh, geofencing. That means the unmanned aircraft system air has some, some limitations in airspace. So we put a fence around that so the, the drone cannot go into it. The data comes normally from the state or from a trusted source, whatever it is, so that there is no potential that we, that we go into this uh, non-flying non zone, assist uh, the pilot or have an automatic uh, function in order to prevent to, to get into this uh, area. The geocaging is something which is identified uh, and predefined by the operation so that you are not getting out of this room. So this, is, this is, could also be assist the pilot, but normally you have automatic modes that you are not able to get out of this cage. So the uh, e-identification MOPS should include uh, use-based standards, including definition of, of the safety data set. So again, it's the safety part of, uh, of, of identification. 
situation awareness, conflict management, geofencing, and other uh, uh, and other modes like uh, monitoring, uh, emergency management, and and others. Um, so four categories of of, of data: the flight itself, ident and static data, uh, uh, intention data, what is your my next uh, waypoint trajectory, and so on. Um, and then it should really be a minimum operation performance standard. I want to repeat that, that we are defining uh, the performance uh, we want to see, and that includes the range, uh, the resolution, the accuracy, and the refreshment rate, so that the data is, is accurate enough and, and you can use this data uh, for whatever application uh, you want to link it. And then it's the guidance on the end-to-end -end validation. Again, the standard should include something. How do I validate that the whole chain is working correctly? So that you validate the standard that it's correctly uh, uh, implied. So, oh, sorry, that was not. <laughs> Just missed the one. I'm nearly done. I'm nearly done. The exciting part is coming. So. Uh, so the, the, it's, it's the requirement on the system level. We don't want to specify uh, the technology behind. We, we keep the, the technology open. There are some, some other activities which are identifying some of the technologies which we, which we can use, and, 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 and that's open to that. But it needs to fulfill the performance level we have defined. So, and this all is, is linked uh, to other standard activities like ASDM and ASD STAN is doing in, in, in Europe. But we are linking that also to, to, to urban air mobility. And again, we have a new working group uh, doing the, the means of compliance, the certification requirements for VTOLs. And that's part of this whole story. And we try to in include that as much as possible. That includes artificial intelligence, that includes uh, software qualification, uh, environmental qualification, and, uh, and the full set here. Just to complete the picture, not only drones, uh, we, we have standards for drones. We also developed now a standard which is called the anti-drone. So we detect uh, uh, drones which are non-cooperative uh, drones flying around so that, that you have a performance level how you detect that and define the interfaces for those who need the data like on an airport, uh, enforcement, police and, and, and other forces. With this, uh, I leave you to the exciting part and thanks for your attention. Thank you, Christian. You know, I can't do that technical stuff that Christian does. And one of the reasons why we wanted to set that up up front is because it helps to express the relationship that comes between the industry, where most of these ideas actually are originating, and then the regulatory community, where we're, we're struggling to understand. And one of the, the functions that these standards actually serve is to assist the regulatory community to understand the capability of the technology and of the vehicles to some degree. Um, some of the things that you were describing, Christian, I recognize as capabilities that came in the drone that I bought up at Best Buy and that we've actually reverse engineered out of what got done in the industry into our technical standards. So it's, a, it's really an interesting dynamic how that works. But one of the things we know we have to have, and this is the, the thrust of this next demo, is we know we need for drones to be able to identify themselves initially so that law enforcement or a security service can understand who's flying the drone and what its purpose is. So that is the beginning of the reason, and then we're gonna build on that throughout the next hour, talking about what this uh, demonstration is going to pr pr show us for drone ID. Now, it's not the only important thing that is being done in the drone world, clearly, but it's one place where even though ICAO doesn't have a mandate to address local drone operations, we have become a place where this conversation is occurring about how we have a common need in 193 countries that the industry could perhaps coalesce around solving even without ICAO standards and recommended practices. 
And that's what's exciting about what we're going to see today, in my opinion. Um, we've seen major progress in this area over the last few weeks, building upon the draft ASTM standard. And we believe that it has the level of flexibility, uh, interoperability, and acceptance in the community that wants to build that it might be a good, solid version one. And we, we know that version one is only a starting place, but it's a starting place that allows us to actually prove our way forward to the beginning of a future evolution that has convergence opportunity. It in, perhaps starts to include legacy users and can combine the activities of this new entrant community with what has been our traditional method for change. We actually need to stimulate our traditional method to something more up-tempo, more dynamic, more agile. So there's some lessons we can learn from this activity. So both the industry and our regulators are eagerly awaiting the completion of a drone ID standard that they can jointly utilize and move ahead. So today we're going to see a series of demonstrations and videos that shows how the the uh, proposed ASTM drone ID standard supports three different functions, a broadcast remote ID, a secure remote ID, and network ID. This will include regulate, the demo is going to include regulators from both the United States and Europe, along with industry partners from Europe, China, and the United States. So it is an international collaboration you're about to watch. Now, this is actually going to be more exciting for the nerds in the room than the rest of us because we're not going to fly the drones, actually, because of safety. Risk, safety management in a building is pretty important for us with a group this size. Um, if it was up to me, I might go ahead and manage the risk, but it's not up to me. So much of this demo will focus on secure remote ID. This is not because we're saying secure remote ID is mandatory, but we believe that because we believe the sovereign states get to set that level. Remember, there are no ICAO standards associated with the use of these technical standards. But we want to show the, the secure remote ID to demonstrate the flexibility and the power of the ASTM standard when it's coupled with some core concepts associated with registration and the evolving trust framework. Now, the fr trust framework is an ICAO project designed to essentially allow us to digitize certification and um, identification globally for all aviation where it matters for safety. So using secure remote ID seems like a nice complement to that. So before I introduce our demo participants, let me thank all of them for the extraordinary efforts they have taken Many have been working for weeks, maybe months, setting up systems, writing code, making videos, prototyping uh, actual hardware, which you're going to see some of this working. And so the participants in this are going to be Mr. Robert Seegers. He's the next-gen ISS architect for the Federal Aviation Administration. Mr. Javier Cana. He's the director of technical standards for DJI. Mr. Zachary Peterson, the head of the Autonomous Vehicle Security, the White Fox Defense Technologies Incorporated, and I'm embarrassing myself because I did not get my information on Unifly. I've got Unifly up here as well, so I'm going to capture that in just a minute. After the demonstration, which should take about 35 minutes, we're going to have a short video from Lorenzo Merzili. He's the manager of innovation and digitalization for Switzerland's Federal Office of Civil Aviation, or FOCA. So industry and government coming together to give you this demonstration and highlighting other aspects of the ASTM, ASTM standard network ID as well. So now I'm going to ask Rob Seegers from the FAA to give you an overview of what you're going to witness, and um, we'll see how it goes. Rob, the floor is yours. Where's he at? Mike. Yes, thank you. Um, so what you're going to see today is uh, basically the remote ID as a, a digital license plate for a drone. 
because it's really comparable to that. And um, the ASTM F38 standard contains both broadcast remote ID and network remote ID and uh, an optional uh, broadcast authentication, which we will also demonstrate. And uh, so the optional authentication will be a drone implementation using Wi-Fi aware by DJI uh, with a verification supported by White Fox uh, Incorporated. So you, you will really see an uh, industry cooperation at the very forefront uh, to be able to make this uh, demo happen. And then following by that, we will have module implementations, which are basically the little pucks that can be used to um, retrofit existing drones uh, of the ASTM broadcast standard with uh, Bluetooth 4 uh, by White Fox and Bluetooth 5 by Unifly, which basically will demonstrate all three uh, transmission uh, mechanisms that are available uh, today under the standard. So we're first going to introduce um, the whole uh, standard to um, a, a video by um, uh, DJI. So. so this is our implementation of the ASTM uh, standard for remote identification using a Wi-Fi based uh, broadcast solution as you saw in the video. Uh, we have demonstrated this solution this morning and all of you are invited to participate uh, as well tomorrow we are ha we're going to have the same demonstration at 8 8 a.m in the morning very close by in uh, park van adventure today as well here we are going to uh, demonstrate a, a glimpse of what you can see tomorrow morning with the protocol uh, using transmitting the data directly from the drones to a, a off the shelf phone so this is the remote uh, identification functionality that uh, is as described in the standard, and this is what we have implemented. So additionally, and a part of this, uh, the standard does not define the authentication method, but gives the option for authentication solutions based on a verifier um, when requested when required in high security uh, risk scenarios. So just with this, I now pass the floor to Rob to introduce the concept for authentication. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to make the link with the, what you already heard yesterday on the International Aviation Trust Framework. So when you think about um, a, a security concept for remote ID authentication, uh, you basically need a global standard for digital identities so that drones can be manufactured with an identity in one country that then can be compatible with another country. And you also need to make sure that those identities can be trusted across the, the global ecosystem. And therefore, you need international auditing uh, of identity issues uh, to ensure global trust. Um, ASTM, ASTM Remote ID Authentication with the, the International Aviation Trust Framework really provides a trusted solution that CEAs can apply um, to UAS high security operations. So it basically gives the state regulators an option to decide where authentication is necessary. And as, as part of this, um, I have a concept this demonstration where, because a lot of this uh, sort of back-end computer work that happens is not really, um, I would call it, attractive to demonstrate. So I'm going to go to a concept here to show what it means to do this um, authentication. So first you get into the manufacturing registration followed by the operator or pilot registration, and then followed by the uh, flight itself uh, with the verification. I can see that I'm already out of uh, sync here, <laughs> which was always the risk. So when you look at uh, this screen above me, you see that the UAS manufacturer uh, basically is uh, submitting a security solution to the CEA 
And uh, once he obtained uh, the approval from the CEA, he uh, then uh, creates a certificate authority that basically is going to produce the digital identities. That uh, certificate authority and its policies and processes that are being used is then followed by an audit by the International Aviation Trust Framework to make sure that it can be trusted. Um, subsequently, uh, the manufacturer creates a uh, private key, and I still am off sync, I see, that is loaded in the drone and followed by um, an so the, one of the, the advantages of the concept here is that the um, standard does not force a specific implementation for the cryptographic authentication. So it's basically crypto agile. And so we have a verifier service that obtains the uh, algorithm from the manufacturer and gets then approval from the CEA to ensure that it is uh, safe to use. And once they get the approval, they can uh, operate as the, as the authentication verifier service. Once that is done, the, um, the public key that is basically the, the uh, counterpart of the authentication gets loaded in the verifier service for the specific drone and also into the federated aircraft registry, which is where uh, the information about uh, the different drones is being kept. And then the uh, drone is basically ready for sale. Once um, Oh, sorry, I'm going to back up the, the, the other screen for a second uh, because I have some bounds on the clicker. So the registration of the drone by the operator or pilot that buys the drone, uh, first of all, we are assuming under this scenario that the operator itself has never registered uh, with the CEA. So he first starts submitting um, a request through the Federated Aircraft Registry, which does via an identity uh, verification service a vetting and proofing of the identity of the operator or pilot. You get the typical questions that you get today via a bank registration, where did you live, what car have you owned, and so on, and then provides identity documents to make sure that they are uh, who they are. Once that is uh, completely proved, the um, the Federated Aircraft Registry uh, generates a operator certificate and provides the operator ID to um, the um, operator itself. Once the operator ID is in, in his hands, he needs to upload that operator ID into the drone. And this is a very important step, um, which is equivalent to what we do today with traditional aircraft, because the operator ID in this uh, scenario is basically what provides the nationality to a drone, and which makes it then internationally compatible. Um, because the, the drone identity itself is, is, in most cases, a serial number, which really doesn't have nationality. And in the next slide, you'll see why that is important. So once the drone is ready for flight, we get to um, the flight stage, and the uh, drone is basically uh, transmitting its identity information. Uh, to a law enforcement agent on, on the ground. And once the law enforcement agent uh, obtains the ID, he sends it via uh, the Federated Aircraft Registry to the verifier service. And the verifier service verifies the authenticity of the information. And the uh, Federated Aircraft Registry also performs a verification of the uh, authenticity of the operator itself uh, to make sure that those two are a, a valid pair. Um, what you can see with the uh, 
the globe uh, connected to the federated aircraft registry is that in case that the drone itself with the operator was actually registered in a different country through the federation of the aircraft registries the um, authentication request would flow back to the country of origin of the drone where it's registered and through the delegation to the verification service um, basically it would mean that a drone from one country would also be verified through the registry of the uh, country where it's flying. This basically uh, fits with the same uh, principle under ICAO of traditional aircrafts where one aircraft is registered in one country regardless where it flies. Once the, um, it's uh, basically uh, verified, uh, you can see that our law enforcement agent is happy. Obviously, uh, you could have the opposite, um, oops, sorry. I see that I'm missing here a scenario. There's always in demos you have a, this clicker is going crazy on me. <laughs> so if you see on this screen, you, you would see the case where um, basically the, the drone is being um, verified and the verif verification fails. And this, this uh, verification failure could either be because the operator is not legit or the drone got spoofed and the information that was being transmitted is non-authentic. Okay, then um, Zachary is gonna show in the next um, slide how we go to a mock-up of a, a registration. So hi, yeah, um, White Fox has developed a CAA portal for the quick, easy, and secure registration of operators, drones, and remote ID modules. Go ahead and start the video. Uh, operators begin uh, by clicking and registering uh, their identity, including any licenses they may hold. Authentication of this data, as Rob uh, said, can happen any number of ways, including uh, completely in the back end. For example, operators may upload a photo of their driver's license uh, or passport. Once authenticated, they can now register their remote ID modules. Again, this is uh, dead simple, with operators uh, giving their modules a name, uh, and if they're using a secure module, they can enter in a cryptographic key, uh, and this can be done, for example, by scanning a QR code. Um, now operators can uh, register their drones, um, and this process is nearly identical. Um, the operators will specify a name, uh, perhaps a type. Uh, if the drone is secure remote ID enabled, they can also scan a cryptographic key in, or they can pair the drone with one of their registered remote ID modules. Um, at this point, the operator has essentially completed the registration process with the CAA and is ready to fly. Uh, as we have I've just seen, this is something that can be done in simply minutes. I think we're doing the DGI demo now. Oh, the, are we? Okay. okay. So now well, what you're going to see here is um, in real life uh, the Wi-Fi aware technology that we are using for remote identification. So what I have in my hand is a off the shelf uh, Samsung phone, uh, two drones also off the shelf, Mavic Air, Mavic 2 Enterprise. We just did a firmware update um, in those drones, and that's it. You're ready to be identified. Is this thing it's number one, right? Yep. 
Okay. You got it. It is. There it goes. Okay. It's just a matter of. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. So um, what you have here is um, of this of the shelf, as I mentioned before, a Samsung phone. We created an app uh, to illustrate the whole concept. So what you're um, what you're looking at the screen in this moment is uh, the information. I mean the, the the location of the drone, the location of the pilot and the location of the actual receiver, the pilot with the person icon, the drone in gray because it's in the ground, and uh, the orange icon representing the location of the actual receiver. So on the right-hand side, you're, uh, we are displaying the information exactly according to the ASTM standard, um, which is covering different type of messages. So there's one basic ID message that is, um, following, is, is broadcasting the ID of, of the drone. This ID, according to the standard, could be the serial number, the registration number, as is in this case, as in the concept that Rob is presenting, or it could be also a UTM ID if necessary. So it, uh, this message also shows the UAS type, is a rotorcraft, you can see on the, on the right if there's still signal. I think it has to do with this USB. Okay, I will continue. So, uh, there is an, an ID message. There is also um, optional messages that the operator can type uh, to let the people around know, like, I'm doing an, an inspection, I'm doing um, any kind of operation. There are also messages uh, regarding to the uh, speed and the accuracy of the measurements and the altitude. So, I'm going to show. Yeah, you can go. You can go because I mean, it, it is not showing. Do we want to change or? I mean, from two and one or something? That's fine. I mean, it was already displayed. You can mention that. So um, one of the things that was happening uh, in the background there um, were DJI drones signing the messages that they were sending out. Those were messages were being received by the app, and the app was then asking the verification service, sometimes we call the cryptographic verification service, whether this message had been correctly signed or not. Um, this is a role that we um, consider uh, vital uh, to securing a remote ID, um, and the role actually serves two purposes. Um, one is that uh, we can provide these online services for verifying the authenticity of messages. So authenticity means, uh, has the message been tampered with? Uh, do we know from which drone uh, that it came from? So also kind of non-repudiation. So we, we know this message must have come uh, from this drone. The other uh, set of services that a CVS can provide are, um, they can help drone and remote ID OEMs integrate crypto in, uh, for providing secure remote ID. And the reason that this is valuable is because crypto is fragile. Um, when it's easy to make mistakes, and when mistakes are made, things can go really bad. In fact, I teach a crypto course, and it's basically just 10 weeks of how stuff goes bad. Um, 
But with the help of a cryptographic verification service, they can uh, do things like generate the keys properly, pick the correct algorithms, implement the algorithms uh, in the correct way, and then store those cryptographic materials, as Rob described, the public keys live uh, or can live in this, the CVS verification service, uh, and then the private keys can uh, live on the, on the uh, drones. We also view this as really valuable as a separate service because it empowers CAAs to decide where they want to place their root of trust. So who plays, who can be a, a CVS? Well, it can be a, a corporate entity, for example, like White Fox. Uh, in fact, we hope all of you choose uh, White Fox as your CVS. We can talk about that at the break, maybe. Uh, but uh, CAAs could also choose to be their own uh, uh, CVSs if they so desired. But kind of breaking that root of trust away from the OEMs and placing it to where the, CA, uh, where the CAAs want to have their uh, root of trust uh, based is a really important concept. So uh, I'd also like to uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the work that uh, White Fox has done in uh, building a secure remote ID module. Any solution to remote ID must meet three essential criteria. It must be secure, it must provide appropriate levels of privacy, and it must be usable. The White Fox remote ID module provides all three. Operators begin by registering their identities with their Civil Air Authority. Next, using their mobile phone, they quickly scan a QR code that registers their remote ID module to their account. This takes only seconds, but provides an unforgeable link between the module, the operator's identity, and his drone. To safely fly their drone, operators simply turn on their module and attach it to their drone. During flight, the module uses its built-in trusted sensors to broadcast vital identity and telemetry data, such as location, speed, and heading, allowing law enforcement and others to establish identity and infer the intent of a drone, all from their current mobile device. The cryptographic assurances provided by the White Fox module mean the most sophisticated attacker will never be able to forge even a single message. Dedicated hardware can also be used to continuously and securely monitor an airspace. Secure, private, and usable. White Fox Remote ID. So there are uh, millions of drones out there currently, uh, and while a vast majority of them may be receiving uh, an update from Javier uh, soon enough, there are plenty that uh, may not receive that update. In fact, uh, the DIY community or the special purpose drones uh, may not only will need remote ID, but they may be the ones that need secure remote ID the most because they may be f uh, flying in these uh, sensitive airspaces. So they're going to need some sort of external module for doing that broadcast and that's what we've built so we have uh, the white fox uh, remote id module um, and they were built with security in mind and with security by default um, our module uses built-in trusted sensors uh, it's got a secure uh, uh, data storage and so in addition to acting as a remote id beacon it also acts like a secure flight data recorder um, now we're currently Currently, um, uh, the model that I'm, you're going to see today is using Bluetooth 4 with security uh, disabled, and we're doing this to kind of show the, the, the breadth of options that are available um, for remote ID broadcast. Um, and it will be, be uh, it is capable of being received by uh, my phone, but also through specialized uh, equipment. And so we have up here a, a, a special receiver. Uh, if you would switch to input two, please. See if this works. Oh, there we go. So here's our uh, display app. Um, you could potentially uh, put a receiver uh, in a place that maximizes range uh, at the you know top of a building, and then uh, look uh, create a display app that's that's local to uh, that receiver. So you can see the little yellow dot there. Uh, there's actually two of them right on top of each other that are being uh, uh, represent each of these uh, white. Uh, uh, White Fox uh, modules. So it displays all of the same uh, ASTM standard uh, data, uh, location, heading, uh, um, uh, speed. It also shows whether this is you can trust this data or not through the authentic field there at the end. Um, this is a product that is 
working today, right? This is something that is immediately adoptable. Uh, I had one other slide, let's see, that was before this. And, uh, and I'll just maybe start talking before it shows up. I want to conclude um, in talking about one of the greatest strengths of the ASTM standard. Uh, one is that you can adopt it today using the existing technologies that exist in mobile phones, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi aware. But one of the other aspects that ASTM considered was, was future proofing. Uh, the, the standard. And so while it currently specifies wi uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, it also um, contemplates you know, what happens if we want to choose a different uh, transport technology, uh, perhaps you know, provide greater range or greater security. And so there's a nice separation between the message set and the transport uh, mechanisms for broadcasts. And so I think uh, the ASTM standard not only got the message right, but they were also got the vision for remote ID right. Yes, so hi, I'm Mark Kuhn from uh, Unifly. Um, a quick overview of uni who we are as Unifly. We're a UTM company. We have a central software platform for UTM infrastructures and founded by air traffic controllers and pilots. Uh, aviation safety is in our DNA. We're a company that's based in, in Belgium. Uh, the vision and the concept of UTM was started in 2012 and the company was actually founded in 2015 and we now are 55 people with subsidiaries in the US, Denmark and Colombia and one of the latest development which is a little bit away from a uh, software platform that we have is uh, our BLIP, our broadcast location and identification platform which we'll show a short video on right now. Increasing popularity of drones calls for new ways to identify them. Who is flying the drone? Where is the pilot? Unifly's blip answers those questions. It acts as an electronic license plate for drones. Blip is part of Unifly's vision for the safe integration of drones. Blip stands for Broadcast Location and Identity Platform. It is a reliable, robust, efficient e-identification and tracking solution for drones. You can find the free Unifly Blip app in the App Store. Blip connects via Bluetooth. Simply select it in the app, attach the Blip to your drone, and you are ready for takeoff. Next, select Start Flight. Do not worry about turning it on. Blip starts automatically when it senses vertical movement. Blip is highly integrated, fully autonomous, and easy to use. Blip complies with the ASTM F38 remote ID and tracking standards and open drone ID protocol to transmit data. Blip has a built-in battery, sensors for position, altitude, temperature, pressure, speed, and heading. All these data are made available in real time. The app also shows the takeoff position and drone location details, such as track direction, ground speed, registration ID, and serial number. So this, uh, what I have over here, is our, uh, our BLIP uh, broadcasting remote ID via, via Bluetooth 5. And I'm now going to show using my mobile phone, which I hope is going to be visible. always nice when you do all of the rehearsals and the dry runs and it all works and then in the actual presentations things go wrong yeah here we go so you should be seeing Okay, so I'm going to leave my phone on the table, so just in case there's something's wrong with um, 
So I'm starting the, uh, the mobile app. Uh, the mobile app sees there is uh, the Bluetooth in the vicinity, so I connect to the, uh, to the device. And what it will do now, it will, uh, uh, it will check for uh, Bluetooth now, and as well as satellite connectivity. Now, since I'm inside of the building and I don't have any satellite connectivities, I'm going to start a virtual flight and simulate uh, GPS connectivity with the device. Um, the mobile app that I have right here is the mobile app which is going to be used by the drone operator flying the drone. We have a similar app um, for the uh, law enforcement where they can just see the information. So I'm going to start uh, the virtual flight, and you see that um, the operator location has been uh, registered now, as well as the current position of the drone, which you'll see changing. And if I go to the details, we have the fields. for ASTM, so you see the track, you see the ground speed, uh, the number of satellites we in and the accuracy of the satellites, uh, the altitude, both the barometric pressure altitude and the altitude coming from the, from the GPS location. Uh, we got some additional information in this field as well, which is more on the status of the, of the device, which you're not seeing right now. So we got, we got battery status uh, and registry ID. Um, also on the first screen at the top, uh, you see the registration ID of the pilot uh, as well as the serial number of the drone. So you, you see the registration ID of the pilot as well as the serial number of the drone. And in the mobile app, we also have uh, a map um, which actually shows you the location of the where the drone took off, which is the green flag, as well as the location, the actual location of the drone when it's uh, flying. Drone operations these days are increasing in number, are increasing in complexity, are increasing in the different type of drone being used. And with this continuous increase, we realize very quickly that it's difficult for a single centralized entity that is traditionally human-centric to be able to manage this complexity. Now, with the advent of new technology, there is an opportunity to open up a market that will eventually improve the system and eventually even make it safer. And the SUS is an attempt to start to create these conditions for companies to come into Switzerland and play a role into this new management of the airspace in the future. SUSI, the Swiss Youth Space Implementation, is an initiative from FOCA to um, facilitate partnership between uh, industries and that will help to integrate all the drone into the airspace. So today we had the collaboration of the different industrial stakeholders, the ANSP Sky Guide and the Federal Office of Aviation to demonstrate the technology of remote identification. This meant having multiple drones flying in the airspace and meant having multiple use space service providers as display providers to basically capture the information of drone flying and displaying their position and their identification on multiple different apps. We believe that in the unmanned sector we can have several players, many different drones and drone operators and everything is interoperable. It doesn't matter what service provider you're using because information is shared between those in an interoperable way which really is the foundation of a federated use-based service architecture. The Swiss architecture supports an open market approach that enables industry to provide services at the pace of the growth of drone operations while having effective oversight from regulators. 
With it being such an open uh, uh, architecture, it allows for uh, organizations to work together to help unmanned aerial traffic become safer. And this means the ability for the industry to offer this service again in a competitive environment. It means the ability for all the citizens in Switzerland to be able to identify drones, protecting the privacy, however, of the drone operator as well as the citizens' privacy, and allows the police to respond to these needs effectively and as they prefer. In a more concrete way, we show um, how we can dispatch, for instance, from the police. The police don't need to sit in the field and wait for a drone to identify uh, the drone. They can be in their office and uh, identify the, the drone through the system. C'est clair qu'on va gagner du temps de savoir exactement qu'est-ce qui vole au-dessus de nos têtes, puisque actuellement, il fallait consulter tous les dossiers et vérifier euh, quel vol. Euh, sur les 1300 vols euh, qu'on dénombre chaque année sur Genève, il y en a 10 par jour, donc c'est vrai que pour nous, c'est une charge de travail. Du moment qu'on aura une identification automatique, euh, bah, ça nous permettra de faire une levée de doute très rapide. The architecture is modular, so it allows any size of business to actually join the, this architecture and actually collaborate at planet scale with uh, industry leaders, even if you are just a small startup. I think the big benefits about the SUSI architecture are that uh, we have an architecture which, which is quite flexible. And uh, I think this is very important because we, we do not know yet where the journey is going. We need this flexibility to adapt to the market needs in future. So now we demonstrated that this remote ID standard works great. What we now have to do is to understand how can we implement that from an operational perspective. The creation of SUSE is an attempt to bring new industrial partners into the ecosystem that will help us and the ecosystem to digitize, to transition from human-centric to digital and machine-centric, and also to share the knowledge and to collaborate towards a faster and accelerated development of this technology in support of drone operations. I was very nervous. So first I want to thank all of you gentlemen, including Mark Cohen from Unifly. I'm sorry I didn't uh, have your name at the beginning to uh, introduce you, but ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in a round of applause for the demonstration. <laughs> to some degree, you know, some of the, the, the hiccups in connectivity demonstrate the challenge where we have, and, and this, is, this is computer um, connectivity, but there are standards for computer technology, computer tech connectivity, that all of these devices were actually relying upon to connect to the really old projectors at ICAO. And so it, it's interesting to see that, that even with the, the differences, we can make things work. Sometimes it doesn't work with the speed we want or exactly the way we want, but it's a beginning. And so this demonstration is really essentially planting the seed for all of us to recognize that we don't have to have one brand of, a, of an identification. If we can follow this standard and build upon it, we can actually promote very rapidly the idea of having transparency and identification for drone operations that the industry can enable very quickly and hopefully have partners, as we've seen, in the regulatory community to make that possible. So along with our demonstrators, so I'm going to ask you guys to come join us here. I don't know if we've got enough chairs for everybody. I've got, I'm missing one, I think, because I had seven. Um, and I want everybody to come sit here together because we're going to have a little um, discussion now and talk about um, the why. So at ICAO, we're really good at creating requirements for people that don't necessarily flesh out the cost benefit. We do that because there's, a, there's an imperative. Sometimes it's a social imperative or a political imperative that we have to take action to mitigate a risk. And the cost associated with that mitigation isn't always clear at the beginning. It becomes clear later. And that's kind of backwards. That's not the way we want to be building standards. And so one of the challenges that our governance structure has created for us is ICAO, become more agile. Think differently about the way you create standards and how you partner with the industry to make those things possible. 
And we're really outside of our box when we talk about remote ID and how we do this with small drones. So along with our demonstrators, I've asked uh, Mr. Philip Canul. He's the chair of the F-38 uh, UAS committee in the ASTM International. He's also the senior vice president of ASTM International. So he has been leading from ASTM the activity associated with the remote ID standard. And also Ms. Jessie Mooberry, who's the uh, head of UTM deployment for Airbus and A3, working out of California. And they've joined the, the demonstrators because we're all in this together from the very smallest operator all the way to the biggest operator. And you heard that earlier today when we were, um, or, or, or yesterday when Boeing was presenting as well. So to begin with, a question for the industry players. You've spent a lot of time and money developing and demonstrating capabilities here. So why is this so important to you? Why is it something that um, you've invested money in? What does it mean for your business? And more importantly, we heard some of that in the video and the demonstrations. What does it mean if we don't? What happens to the industry if we don't move forward with a common standard? So I'd like to ask uh, any of the, the reps from the industry if they'd like to kick off and, and take a stab at that just to get us started. What happens if we don't do this? Hopefully we'll make those live. Check. Okay. Well, um, our position on, on, on identification for drones is, is, is simple. is, is safety, is accountability, is um, is giving the chance for regulators and anyone who legitimate needs uh, to identify who's flying nearby to provide uh, something that currently is lacking um, in the broad spectrum, which is accountability. So we already provided a solution with Aeroscope, and that has been proven to be uh, very effective on for infrastructure, for protecting high um, security uh, risk uh, areas. But with this solution, we think that this will broaden the the um, the impact on the industry and will make it accessible for everyone, and especially because we are thinking of commonly carried handheld devices. Mm -hmm. um, so for the question on, on what happens if we do nothing, so, um, well, there are some legitimate concerns from, from some uh, sectors from the government on the risks, again, uh, of, of, not, of not being able to enforce the law first by identifying to whom uh, we, we need to, to, to identify. So um, doing nothing means that the risk could continue, that uh, operations, that especially legitimate operations will not be able to be differentiated from, from the small number of uh, users that might be using this for, for bad purposes. So it's also protection for the good um, users, for the good operators. Okay, thanks. That's great. Jesse. So I can talk to that. Um, so I can talk to that. Um, so I can talk to that. All right, I'm on. Good evening, everybody. Are you awake? <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve, your qu second question was what happens if we don't? And I think we're seeing this in the manned aircraft industry right now. We're having problems with not having a digital identification that is transferable from state to state. So we see this in the airworthiness certificates, in the maintenance records, um, and it's something that the trust framework uh, is working to solve. But I think we can learn a lot from this remote identification standard and to make sure that we don't have a divergence in the industry of what the commercial air transport industry is doing and what some of the new entrants is doing. Because the reality is, ICAO likes to say, an aircraft is an aircraft is an aircraft. And if we're talking about interoperability, we need a digital identity that will be able to work for all aircraft since we're talking about a fully integrated sky. Uh, Florian from the SJU talked about U-Space being not just a segregated airspace, but a network of um, services. Air traffic management is the same thing. It's a set of services. And so as we think about the convergence of ATM and UTM, we have sets of services that need to interoperate. And the first step to getting there is uh, digital identities. Okay, thanks. 
One of the things that uh, White Fox pushed really hard for in the ASTM standard was security. Uh, and that it be one, done right, but two, that it be, be optional. Because we may not need uh, a secure ID in every setting, but in certain environments, it's gonna be really important that uh, impersonation becomes impossible. Uh, because without security, I can be your drone. I can be a police drone. And so in those environments where security is important, we now have an option for turning it on and doing it correctly. You bring up a good point that from, from the aviation safety regulators perspective, a lot of times we don't think about the bad actor because we're used to just taking care of things amongst people who actually just don't want to die or kill someone. But someone who's worried about security starts to think about someone who's actually trying to do bad things. And that's an important combination that has to be taken into account in developing these concepts. So that's really good. Thank you. Anybody else want to tackle this? Uh, I'm going to turn to the regulator approach next. So, so, so for the two regulators, um, you've spent a lot of time and money trying to regulate drone ID as quickly as you can. From your perspective, why is this important now? Why is this something that you're really engaged in at this point? Rob, you want to take a stab at that? For me, it's what's really important is that um, by early adoption of a standard, um, there's two aspects here. The standard is almost ahead of the technology, which is great, um, because that doesn't often happen. And second, um, it um, creates a global adoption and uh, full, in, full integration so that there is interoperability. Because if we have to implement multiple systems, not only by industry, but also as a, as a regulator to be able to integrate multiple models or, or manufacturers and different uh, systems, it drives a lot of costs. And it doesn't only drive costs for industry, but it also drives costs for the regulator. And so the, the use of standards early on and the, I would say, security by design um, in the standards so that they are also interoperable because one of the, the biggest hurdles with security is that often it creates a, a solution for a one-to-one -one, um, interoperability and not for a global interoperability. And this is security by design. Okay, thanks. Lorenzo? Yes, for us, it's, a, it's really a practical problem that we have in Switzerland. I mean, it's, you, can, uh, you can see the, during the video the policeman saying we have thousands of flights going on, and Switzerland is a very drone-sensitive country. That means they have hundreds of requests for, please do something. What is this drone or what is not, not that drone? During the making of that video, even if we had jackets and we had authority people, we had at least five or six concerned citizens coming to us and say, what's going on, right? So there is a, a, reality, a real need. That's the problem. So we're not creating regulation because we need to create regulation. We are creating regulation because there is an actual need to address a problem. And when we look around for solutions to that, the ASTM standard seems a natural place to go. And that's why we, we started quite early, even if the standard is not yet out, to look out, can this be operationalized? Can we use this standard to be successful in addressing the need? The, the video doesn't show, but behind that demo, we had 50 or 60 police from all the different countries, all the different councils in Switzerland, looking at that and asking them, are you okay with this? Is this the solution you want? And if the answer is yes, then we will go and regulate. So I think this is the right approach to, to, the, to the development of this new way of regulating. Identifying the need, testing the solutions, and if the solutions work, then regulate effectively to make sure that they can be implemented. And that's what we are doing, actually. Okay, thanks. So all the comments so far have actually caused a lot of envy amongst those of us who are involved in standardizing aviation because the way we work is very methodical very, very uh, thought through, and no standard should be created before its time, right? That's what we work on. So data communications between pilots and air traffic controllers we're 30 some odd years into. We haven't gotten there yet. I kid you not, not, not globally. And 
Christian talked about the complexity of getting all that put together in the European sphere, but it's not unlike what we see in the United States or in North America. It's not unlike what we see in other parts of the world. So this process feels different because of the way it was prototyped. So Philip, I'd like you to talk with us a little bit about what the process was and why it's different. And also I'd like to talk about, I'd like to, for you to talk about some of the concerns I've heard that maybe we're not ready yet to go off on one standard now. So maybe it isn't mature enough. So how do you address that? Uh, which one do you want me to answer first? Go, go, go with it either way. All right, so about where we were and how we got here. Uh, and, and this standard, you're right, it, it, it developed a little bit different than a standard normally does in that uh, you know, quite a few regulators and, and the industry came to us and said, we need a standard. After the FAA held their arc, we had some guidelines, we had some ideas, we did not think the time was, no standards ready before time. We didn't think we were ready to pull the trigger on it because we weren't sure what we needed to do. So we let the dust settle a bit, let people digest the recommendations that came out of the ARC. We listened to some comments and concerns from our friends in Europe. And then we had industry and regulators come to us and actually say, hey, here's what we want. So we had, we had a good idea. Industry had some good solutions, potential solutions based on some guidelines from the ARC. And, and we had some motivated individuals, and there was motivation for several reasons. The regulators wanted it because the security folks wanted this capability as well. Industry wanted it because they were going to be restricted from expanded operations till this was in place. They, sure, they saw it as a way to implement this and to get things like operations over people beyond visual line of sight, operations at night, basically all expanded operations to a certain degree. And, and they saw the commercial benefit to this. So there was a lot of motivated folks. So what I thought would be a small, friendly group of about four or five people turned into a group of about 40. And so it was like herding cats a little bit. But they all got, pretty much got on the same page. And not only was this a, an enabler for extended operations, but the reason why it took us a little bit longer, we wanted to make sure that nothing we did here would negatively impact UTM. So this is really, remote idea is really one of the foundation blocks to UTM, and that's why we worked so hard on getting the, the DSS right and making sure we had network compatibility with this as well. So that's, that's, I think that's the first part of your question. Right. Not sure. Yeah, that, sounds, that, sounds, that sounds about right for the first part of the question. Because I went off a little bit on tangents, but usually a regulation comes out first and we start building a standard to fit that. In this case, it was kind of go going in sync. Now we've got version 1.0, which was approved last Thursday in Raleigh, North Carolina. We came to consensus, we adjudicated quite a few comments, and we, we actually adjudicated quite a few negatives. And um, we, are, we have approved a standard. It's going to our commit, commit, Committee on Standards to make sure we followed the process exactly. And we expect publication after the editors take care of it and put it in a good format and make it really pretty. We expect publication sometime in January. This is version 1.0. We have a lot of comments that were, we think require some consideration in a future version. We're gonna start addressing those now. The other big uh, hit thing that we're waiting for is when the FAA publishes their NPRM, which is, has been delayed for quite a while. So they expect to, pub, well, they ex expect to release the NPRM in December. We're gonna take a look at that and see where we need to make adjustments on the standards and again, we're going to start working on version 1.1 or version 2.0 or however we decide, however many adjustments we need to make. We don't think we have the 100% solution now. We think we're 85, 95% there, but with the release of the NPRM and feedback from European partners and some international partners, we're going to start working on version 2.0. Now, I forgot really the second part of your question. That was the second part of the question. It was the, it was the idea that while this may be a beginning, it's not the end. Absolutely, right? absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And we've talked to quite a few regulators, and we want to make sure we got, get this right. In the United States, it's the FAA's number one UAS priority, and I'm sure it's important to a lot of other regulators. And we've shared the drafts of the standards to regulators all over the world. We're getting input from them. We expect more. Okay. Thank you. So thank, thanks for that that readout of how it worked. Now, there are different ways of creating standards, and you know, uh, Christian talked about the standards roundtable that we, we have at ICAO where we all come together and we discuss our work plans, et cetera. There are ways where we're going to need to be able to share 
the material. And some of that still needs to be worked out. I think there's no question about that. So, but one of the questions actually that comes to mind here is, where do people go to get their hands on the ASTN standard? And so. Well, we're sharing it with regulators freely and other SDOs. We've, we've, we've had good relationships with the other SDOs. We've incorporated some other standards like the ANSI CTA standard. I'm really intrigued with the uh, geofencing and geocaging work that you're doing in it because we're not tackling that and it looks so like something we may want to discuss in the future. So we're sharing this with SDOs, we're sharing it with, with uh, regulators. Um, ASTM has a low bar of entry to join it as a member for $75. This is not a pitch for, for joining it, but you get access to all this aviation standards. And, and this standard will be published in the near future. You can have access to it then um, for a low cost of entry. But we are sharing it with regulators and us, other SDOs. Okay, thank from, you. From a nerd's perspective, uh, Intel has released their open drone ID source code uh, on GitHub. as op yeah, It's open source. You can go and look at it and, and uh, integrate it now. Okay. And, and I just want to comment that that was the initial basis that we used to formulate the standard. So a lot of the work that was on the open drone um, piece is what we used as the foundational document to build the ASTM standard. So this was done differently from the perspective of aviation. Maybe not differently from the computer perspective. I think the people in Silicon Valley have done things similar to this in the past. But, but that's bringing a process change to our environment that perhaps we're gonna experience in the UTM world that the rest of us, I don't know how many of you are standard regulators, like I'm representing at ICAO, we need to be thinking about how our processes can evolve based upon how this comes forward, right? Okay, so how do we move forward without waiting for years for regulators to adopt this standard? Or is there a bar, is there a threshold of success or failure? This is an open question for anybody. I'll take a crack at it. I, I think industry has already started moving forward. You've seen the demonstrations. Um, the Drone Advisory Committee to the FAA in the U.S. has recommended, um, well, the, the, the FAA asked for how can we get people to adopt this before the regulation comes out. Drone Advisory Committee gave several recommendations on how to do that. They recommended the AT ASTM standard. There are folks now getting ready, front loading, and they're gonna uh, implement the standard as we speak. And that'll give us data that we can use in the next year and a half before a rule comes out in the United States that we can adjust the standard. And we hope to get from our European partners as well data that tells us maybe where we're not exactly right on check and we can make those adjustments. So I think the answer to the question that industry is already moving ahead on that and, and your comment about how this wasn't really done normally, we had a lot of you know, high tech companies, Silicon Valley companies and, and Eu European startups as well and, and they don't move at the, at the way some larger companies do in bureaucracies and the government. So it was, it was lead, follow, get out of the way. So we had our first draft in 11 months which was pretty lightning speed for a standard being developed. Yeah, okay. All right, so Jesse, I'm gonna come back to you because you're in a kind of a hybrid role here. You're, you're sitting as part of Airbus, very much associated with this new world, but there's a recognition across the organization of the applicability elsewhere. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about how that connection could be made. Certainly. Um, let me just briefly respond to Phil, though, because I think the most important part of the process was scoping, making it laser sharp, focused on small UAS in non-dense airspaces. And so they were able to get it out because of the scoping. So if you ask me what's next, I think we need to tackle urban air mobility. It's, it's, in, it's in progress. <laughs> Um, so I, I can touch on what I think needs are the, the next step and the needs and, and we're providing that to ASTM directly and, and Airbus was a part of um, helping provide feedback for that standard. Um, but, but Steve, to your question, um, I think it's a huge opportunity for the manned aviation industry. Um, I think that uh, we now have a machine for turning out innovations that can be transferable for the existing aviation community. 
Um, Airbus's view on airspace and UTM is um, very similar to the FAA and EASA's, which is incremental growth, incremental introduction of new technologies, crawl, walk, run, if you will. Um, and so we're using UTM to support small drones today. Um, urban air mobility vehicles next, helicopters after that, high altitude pseudo satellites, and then eventually commercial air transport aircraft, um, which is our, our bread and butter. And so the UTM wave uh, is a huge opportunity for introduction of these technologies, um, putting in place new fresh processes like the, the standards work ongoing, and also making sure we have that really quick uh, iteration and feedback cycle, which is um, actually not that new to the aviation industry. If you think about our safety culture and our, our reporting, um, which is one thing I think the drone industry should be learning from the manned aviation industry as well, is as soon as there's a crash, um, there should be a, a feedback uh, loop for that crash. But I think we see it as, as a huge opportunity um, at Airbus. Thanks. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask anybody else if they've got any, any feedback or comments on how we expand on this experience and tackle the next steps in building out UTM, for instance, or in how we transfer this methodology to the rest of our uh, capabilities. Lorenzo? Yeah, maybe one other thing that I wanted to mention that uh, was particularly, let's say, exciting to us when trying to operationalize this and say, well, let's see if it can be used. You mentioned DSS uh, field, you know. It's the idea that this technology that we are using now for remote ID is indeed only a foundation for additional services that can be built on top of it without having to reinvent the wheel and deploy new infrastructure. So for, for, a, for an authority that is at the ultimately going to end to spend money in, to this, you know, in making sure that it works, it's very exciting because we are looking really at a building, as Jesse said, service by service, foundation by foundation. However, on top of each other, in a, in a way that is organic and that can be leveraged, you know, the previous development for future successes. That's very important. So that we really avoid having to deploy 20 different services with different underlying technologies. I think that's, to me, the key for moving forward. So now we're going to make remote ID stable and functioning. We're going to test it. We're going to make calculation about it. We're going to learn how the SS contributes to that. And when flight plan sharing comes through, when uh, strategic deconfliction comes through, and we're going to use those services on the same infrastructure, well, a lot of the work would have already been done. Right? And that's how we can quickly move to the next service. And then the next one comes, and the next one comes. So that's exciting for us. OK. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know that we're, we're going to run a little long if I let this wrap. So it's right at 5.30 right now. But I think it's worth it that we tease out just a little bit more before we, we go to uh, the end of the day. Um, so drones don't fly across borders much. We're in an international organization here. So do we know that we're close to a global consensus on what we're going to do here? Is that what I'm hearing from the people who are on the stage? Christian, you haven't said, you, you gave us the presentation, but what do you think? Uh, yeah, I think we're coming quite close. I I'm, I'm, I'm think we're close, yeah. We're not there yet. There, there are still some questions and, and concerns. And uh, as Phil said, we are at version 1.0. I think uh, we need more, and that's something which is really new, because we never did it before, that we have a not mature standard published. We never did that. Mm -hmm. So we're not doing that at Euroke. That would never ever get through and, and, and uh, would never ever be supported by the, by, by the regulator. But that seems to be a new approach, you know, <laughs> to, to, to slowly Tatorate. go this way. Yeah. yeah. But I think we are getting close. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not that we don't have a m mature standard. One of the, one of the, uh, you know, the guides that we're using was the recommendations from the FAA's ARC. And we were, we were at a little bit of a disadvantage because although there, you know, the FAA, as a regulator in the United States, wanted this standard out very bad, they couldn't tell us what they wanted because they were under the rulemaking process. So we were kind of, we were kind of trying to, it was a little bit of a guessing game, and we just had to glean information. So, but the industry was so motivated to put something out that was, was practical and usable and was a foundational element for UTM that that's why we decided, okay, it's, it's time to start, you know, hit the start button and at least start it and try to sync it up with 
the FAA's regulation. We got input from regulators in Europe. We had comments from regulators in the Pacific, and, and we thought we had enough information where we, we could start going. So, uh, not that it's a it's not that it's a half baked a half baked standard. It's just that we expect that there's going to be more input, especially from the FAA, when the rule comes out, and then we'll hit the reset button to see if there's anything different. I have to tell you, some of the what I'm gleaning from what's going to come out the NPRM is I don't think we're too far off. The one thing that I that I am expecting is that there will be a to, to have the broadcast solution work at 100% rate, regulators are going to have to put in an overlay on that standard, and they're going to have to actually dictate what the broadcast mechanism is. Is it going to be Bluetooth? Is it going to be Wi-Fi? Is it going to be something else? That's the part that I think we'll have to go back to the, to the well and make sure that, that that's accommodated in the standard. Right now, we have broadcast Bluetooth network and an off-ramp for any other backbone that it's going to require. But, but, but there's still some guessing about what's, what the regulator in the U.S. is going to require. I think from my perspective, the, one of the things that I think is most exciting about this is the modularity about how this can be assembled. And the idea that whatever your spectrum you're going to apply isn't, doesn't dictate how the rest of the system is assembled. So I'm, I'm really excited by that. I'm also excited for the regulators in the room on the idea that we actually are going to rely on some sophisticated cryptology to do this, the, the authentication and then utilize the internet essentially to be able to operate instead of creating dedicated aviation communications infrastructure that's very expensive when we try and do it the way we've done it in the past. So I want to ask each of you for a closing and you don't have to, you can close however you'd like, but as you do that, I need you to weave, weave in what do you think ICAO needs to do next with regard to remote ID and how we build forward. So start at the end. Not you, Rob. So, so you'll need to grab a mic. Okay. Yeah, as a closure, I think um, what was important for us is uh, in the whole process uh, is that we have the European standard in the regulations in June where uh, people in the open category need to broadcast their, uh, their ID, remote ID. Um, we stepped on board with ASTM because the remote ID in Europe is a subset. So we think the good standard as a global is, is important for the industry to move, uh, to move forward. Uh, I think as for uh, for ICAO, it's uh, I think it's uh, talking to the to the member states, uh, explaining what we've did, and that is important for uh, moving forward with uh, the drone industry. Thanks, Mark. Rob. So there's actually several aspects where ICAO can help. Uh, continue the uh, work on the international aviation trust framework uh, at the most expedient. Uh, way possible so that it actually can go operational um, because trust uh, is really essential when you are dealing with security um, and to your comment around drones are not flying internationally which is true they also fit very easily in a carry-on and so they show up anywhere I have flown and mine in 16 countries so right. I, I, and so <laughs> portability of the drone into those countries and being able to legitimately fly, still being able to securely identify yourself will require an ICAO supported trust framework and standards around uh, digital registration uh, where registries are actually federated and interoperable. And today, there is no standard for that. And we really need ICAO to help get that off the ground. Thank you, Rob. Jesse. Yeah, I, I agree with Rob. Um, and I would add to that, I think a, a global um, framework for UTM as well would be incredibly helpful because we're seeing a divergence right now between IASA and the FAA on, on how they're handling it. Um, and it's going to really impact the operators as well as the manufacturers, as well as anyone else in the ecosystem. Um, the, the drone industry right now is, is very much trying to figure out who it is and what it wants to be and is there really a business model here? And um, I think we need to give them a bit of stability or at least a, a path forward um, that there will be a, a future if you open a business uh, doing something with drones. 
Um, and then I think specifically onto remote ID, I think this is a huge win for the industry. And um, I think we need to um, acknowledge that there will be future iterations of it, but design a process that can allow for gates and can allow for um, updates. You know, it was, it was scoped for small UAS, um, and it does a really good job of, of serving small UAS right now. Um, the next step is urban air mobility, um, and, then, and then beyond that. Um, so as long as we think about these standards not as a be-all, end-all that should take five years, but instead of an incremental uh, reflection of, of how the industry is going to move, um, I think we'll win. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I like Jesse. In my opinion, the, the great experience we had with the remote ID standard is this new way of operating, this new process. I think for a regulator, it takes quite a while to adapt to it. However, given the pace at which technology is evolving, we don't see how this can be done differently. The idea that we can regulate a technology that we don't understand before the industry comes up with the technology and the standard in this new world, is it, it doesn't work. So I personally welcome this new way of operating very much. It requires a lot more engagement with industry. It requires regulators to deal with the technology and learn the technology. It requires industry to explain to the regulators or to do outreach in regards to this technology. And I think if the one thing that ICAO could do is to embrace somehow this new process in the way that ICAO can and recognize that that's a good way to move forward in this new environment. Thanks, Lorenzo. Yeah, Bill? just. A couple of quick points, you know, to the comment that drones don't fly cross border now. They will be flying across border in the future, and we got to start preparing for that. With respect to urban air mobility, uh, I totally agree that that that's the, that's really the next step where we can start looking at how this can support that as well. We do have a group, an, ACE, an administrative uh, committee, working on urban air mobility and EV tolls, and they're looking at that now. All the all the things we looked at it at, at, at remote ID are being looked at again for for um, urban air mobility. And, and just, just to talk a little bit about process and where we're going in the future, about 80 or 90% of the people who worked on the remote ID standard are also working on the UTM standard. So the same aggressive approach that they took without compromising safety at all and making sure they cross their T's and dot the I's, they're the same group of people really working on a UTM standard now. Okay. Uh, I think we have the possibility at ICAO that we can make use of, of industry standards. I think uh, you got the mandate for, from at the General Assembly last year. Uh, well, no. Yeah, it was this year. <laughs> and, Just a month uh, ago. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, to make better and more use of, of industry standards, if, if you have something like that where you see it was globally developed, it is globally accepted, it doesn't need to be, doesn't need to be re repeated here at ICAO, so make good, good use of, uh, of industry standards. We're using more or less the same process as, as you are using uh, to develop SARPs. We have an open consultation process, so, so participate. You don't need to be a member. This is globally uh, available and publicly available to contribute here. I think it's a win-win situation. Okay. So in one word, um, the role of a cow is mainly on interoperability. So a cow has a, a privileged position worldwide to promote interoperability um, in terms of what kind of solutions we are going to have in, in terms of a standard, what kind of standard we are going to use. And one good example is already ongoing, and we saw it in one of the sessions uh, with the manufacturer's serial number um, code that now is managed by ICAO, is the CTA standard. So that's already happening. ICAO is already taking the lead to, to make this interoperable. So that's that's the role that I think is the most valuable for the time coming. In the near term. Okay. I think the role ICAO can play is as an educator around uh, what it means to be secure remote ID and what it means when it's not secure. What are the risks associated with insecure remote ID? I think the other uh, element to there is when is it appropriate to use uh, secure remote ID? Is it uh, over uh, critical infrastructure? Is it over uh, you know, large public areas? What are those sensitive uh, areas? And that you know that may uh, end up being a you know, individual CAA decision. Uh, but I think ICAO's you know, global reach can provide good guidance there. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all for um, your insights. This 
to some degree, when I when I listen from the perspective of IKO the organization, this sounds really intimidating, and you're like, whoa, I don't know. And you you were all introduced to Leslie's team, right? It's it's not we're not a big team that's involved in all this. But if you step back a bit, if, if ICAO the institution includes the regulatory community of the 193 states, then the most important thing we can do here is to illuminate and help explain the methodology change that we're seeing that's starting to make this success. And to make that okay to utilize and so I'm, I'm really, I'm hopeful that what we can do is we can see this initial success. We can see the beginning of this outreach to essentially a user community that's outside of aviation with law enforcement, who actually is one of the, the key constituents we're trying to satisfy. And these non-aviation, I'm not going to say non-aviation. Anybody who flies a drone now is a quasi-aviator, right? You know, you, see, you don't have to have a lot of skill, but, but, you, but you are in the airspace. So I think that there's, there's a need for us to, as you said, do a lot of education on how things fit together. And, to, and, and I believe our role at ICAO is to make the regulatory community as competent and knowledgeable as possible with what you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it so that they can keep up. And it's clear that we have two regulators on the stage here who have been doing just that. And uh, I think we have many more who are in the audience who also are exposed to this and are wanting to get on board. So thank you all very much for expressing your views, being part of the demonstration, being part of the work leading up to Drone Enable and the dialogue here. And I want to thank the audience. We had a couple of questions that came in on the email, and I was able to weave those in. I want to ask you all, take your homework home tonight, talk about how do you see ICAO's role? What is the change in ICAO that you need to see? And when I say ICAO, not just the organization, but how we relate to the regulatory community that would assist with taking this embryonic work in small drones and replicating it out across the entire aviation infrastructure. Because it sounds like that's what we have an opportunity to do. And I'm really interested in your views and your ideas leading into tomorrow and as we wrap up during the conference on how we're going to do that in a way that welcomes the drone community into the airspace and takes advantage of some of these lessons we've learned. Please give the, uh, the panel a round of applause for all of the effort. And I'm looking for Denis. What kind of uh, housekeeping do we need to do, sir? Okay, we're done with the program today. Tomorrow's start is at 9 o'clock, and we have a reception outside. I believe it's set up as we get done. I think it's a well-earned break for all of you. Thank you all very much.